Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And let's begin class with prayer this morning. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to study. And we're studying such a, a beautiful symbol, symbolic system that you gave us to teach us that your plan to heal, restore, and bring us all back into unity with you. We ask that your spirit will join us today, enlighten our minds, help us be able to put the pieces of the puzzle together to see the clear picture you have for us at this time. Pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Uh, one, a couple of announcements, I guess. One uh, is... I told you we have some new things uh, that are be coming out this year we've been working on. This is a preview. It's not ready today, but this is a preview of a new children's book that, uh, that Stephanie Land has uh, done an incredible job. Biblical Concepts Made Easy. And uh, this, we will have these hopefully by next, next month. But inside are all of these activities for kids to do. And, and you're going to love it. It's just fantastic. And it teaches all the truths that we've come to love in this class in here. So we will have, hopefully, this, this is just a, a sample preview. Uh, they haven't come off the press in mass production yet. But these should be available next month at least uh, by, the, by the time. And then if you're online watching, you'll be able to order these online to share. And we're, we're expecting a lot of excitement about those. So I wanted to let you know about that. And if you didn't get the email we sent out this week, we're doing class a little different today. And so our potluck weekend, I have uh, prepared a, a PowerPoint program related to the subject matter for today. Dean, can you put up our first slide? There we go. Uh, in which is the, the title for the lesson this week is Light from the Sanctuary. And we will be going over that subject matter, but uh, we won't be going over it in the way the lesson has constructed it. Um, you've all, if, you're, if you have a history in the Adventist church, you have had the, the investigative judgment, heavenly sanctuary message presented to you multiple times, and it's pretty much the same presentation over and over again. And uh, I'm going to lay out for you what I think the, the message our church was given to take to the world, and I think you'll see a significant difference in how it has been obstructed by what is actually presented to the world. And uh, the, uh, the message that... Uh, that the Adventist church has found itself taking to the world. It's the one unique doctrine of the Adventist church as actually has its founding in the preaching of a Baptist minister called William Miller in the early 19th century. And he began preaching the soon coming of Christ. And you all know, based on the, his, his interpretation, the prophecy of Daniel 8, 14, and the 2300 years in the sanctuary would be cleansed, and he calculated that date starting at 457 BC, ending in the fall of 1844, and concluded that the cleansing of the sanctuary, the second coming of Christ, this was part of the great awakening that, uh, that, uh, that really impacted North America and, and much of Europe, uh, where this great anticipation for the second coming of Christ, but as we know, Jesus did not return in 1844, which led to the great disappointment and uh, the understanding that William Miller's uh, conclusion that the sanctuary cleansing with the second coming was wrong. Many um, became disillusioned, just gave up the idea on the prophecy completely, where others uh, went back and re-examined and concluded that nowhere does the Bible teach the earth is a sanctuary, uh, and there's another sanctuary in heaven, and, and thus they felt that the dates were correct, but the original event that William Miller um, presented was incorrect, and so they began teaching the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. What the message was supposed to teach was the final work of Jesus to make his people righteous so that we become the righteousness of God, as it says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, uh, and preparing us to meet him so that when we meet him, we will see him face to face where we will be like him, as the Bible says. But all of this got twisted by the legalists in the camp who rejected the truth that God's laws design law and instead clung to the Roman view of imposed law. And instead of teaching the reality that Jesus cleanses us and removes sin from us, they began teaching a message that sin is being removed from a structure, a building, records uh, in heaven, a legal type of work. And I presented and dealt with the historical way it's been presented and contrasting that many times. Uh, you can find this in a variety of our online resources, the Sanctuary and the Feast Day Seminar, the Sanctuary Metaphor in the Power of a Love Training Equipping Course, Lecture 11, the Wedding of Christ uh, to His Bride, Preparing the Church uh, for the Second Coming. That presents this, m this message about healing, cleansing uh, to, uh, through, through the biblical 
uh, landscape only, not using any only white com comments, whereas the Heavenly Sanctuary and the Investigative Judgment magazine is specifically written for Seventh-day Adventists because it not only uses the Bible, but it uses a lot of Ellen White quotes showing that, that the original message is not what we've been taking to the world. So today I'm not going to go and stay locked into the traditional way of presenting it. I want to present this thing as I think it should have been presented from the healing view, from the design law view. And the most important question you have to ask before you even dig into the information, which will slant everything you believe about this beautiful metaphor that God has given us, is how do you understand God's law? What law lens are you looking through? How does God, do you believe God's law functions as the design protocols the creator built reality to operate upon? Or do you believe that God's laws function no differently than the laws that creatures make up? Rules that require judicial oversight and the infliction of external penalties. If you believe that any part of God's government uses imposed, made-up rules with inflicted punishments, then your conclusions about this beautiful symbolism through the sanctuary metaphor will be perverted twisted, distorted to such a degree that you'll end up worshiping a creature in place of the creator. While you claim to be worshiping the creator, just as the Jews who crucified Christ did as recorded in chap John chapter 8, they claimed God as their father, and Jesus told them they were of their father, the devil. Why? Because they believed God's law functioned like human law. They were legalists. They believe law-breaking required inflictions of punishment. They believe sacrifices were required to pay the sin debt to, of the offended God or the offended God's law. So every question, every metaphor, every Bible verse, parable, or symbol God has ever given us gets warped and distorted if our understanding of God's law is no different than the way human law functions. So first question, how do you understand God's law functions? Design protocols that reality is built upon and breaking those laws damages the lawbreaker and requires God to intervene, to heal, restore, to fix, to cleanse, to set things right, to fix the problem? Or do you believe God's law functions like human law, a system of rules that have no inher inherent consequence and that sin creates a legal problem and we are under external legal condemnation from the heavenly government and God is the source of inflicted pain, suffering, and death that he inflicts uh, as so-called just punishment for our sin crimes, and therefore something must be done to God or God's law to pay for the crime so he won't kill us. Your view of law determines how you understand the problem and the solution for it. So questions to consider as we look at this topic. What is the sanctuary that is being cleansed? What is it? Where is the cleansing of the sanctuary taking place? What is the sanctuary, uh, yeah, from what is the sanctuary being cleansed? From what is it being cleansed? Where does sin actually happen? Does sin happen in record books or in hearts and minds? Can God cleanse the universe from sin by erasing historical documents, by erasing records? <clears throat> Does adjusting legal status in books remove sin from hearts and minds? If God is going to cleanse his universe from sin, from where must the sin be removed? If we have a legal record vault in heaven where all the recorded sins of all the people from all times have been written down, and Jesus and his angels go through all those records and erase all the records of the sins from the record books of the people who have made a legal claim of the blood of Jesus to pay their sin debt to the Father... But the sinners who claimed the blood of Jesus as their legal payment have not had their hearts cleansed as Jesus cleansed the universe from sin. If we have a legal record vault in heaven where all the sins ever committed by every person are recorded and Jesus and his angels do nothing to the record. In fact, the record stands for all eternity. Say we have a Bible in heaven and we always are able to reference David's sin with Bathsheba. But Jesus cleanses the hearts and minds, the characters, the souls, the spirits of all who have surrendered in faith to him so that the sinners are restored to holiness, righteousness, and have a new heart and right spirit as David prayed. They have the mind of Christ and are at one with God again. The people are cleansed from sin and all who refuse to be cleansed die eternally. Then has Jesus cleansed his universe from sin. 
Which of these two versions cleanses the universe? The legal adjustment version or the healing the hearts and minds version? And which version keeps sin in existence? Which version is based on design law and which is based on imposed law? And which version would Satan want taught in the church? And this is the problem with Christianity as a whole and the Adventist doctrine on the investigative judgment, as it has been taught by the legalists in the church since 1888 when they rejected the advancing light of God's design law and embraced the lie that God's law functions like human law. The big overview of this message is very simple. Before Jesus returns, he cleanses his bride, his people, makes her ready to meet him face to face. As scripture says, we shall see him face to face for we shall be like him. We become like him by the work of Christ via the Holy Spirit, healing, cleansing, renewing, recreating us in actual righteousness. This requires our heavenly physician, our high priest, our savior, to examine and diagnose, judge, what is actually wrong in our hearts and minds, where we are out of harmony with him and his father, and then to apply his blood, symbolic of his sinless life, to us, so that we become partakers of the divine nature, as Peter wrote, so that we receive the actual new heart and right spirit, have the law written upon the heart and mind, as the new covenant says, so that it's no longer our sinful, fear-ridden selves that live, but Christ lives in us so that our thoughts, desires, motives are cleansed from fear and selfishness, and we are set right, purified, cleansed to be like Jesus. This is the reality of the message. It's a simple message. Jesus came, became a real human being. He took up humanity, damaged and infected by fear and selfishness because of Adam. He was tempted on all points like we are, but Jesus destroyed the infection of fear and selfishness at the cross, killing those elements, and rose in a purified, perfected humanity. The motives of perfect love and trust. He offers all of us to receive his victory in us. The Holy Spirit takes what he's accomplished, reproduces it in us, so we get a new heart and right spirit. We have the mind of Christ. So this is the ultimate, and he finishes this work, sealing or settling us into our eternal loyalty to him, making us united with him in heart, mind, and spirit, and then he comes to receive us. That's the simple message. So let's go through the data of how this has been shown through scripture in multiple different metaphors teaching the same thing. So our points to clarify that we're going to clarify now are the following. What is the heavenly sanctuary? What is it? What contaminates it? What does it mean to cleanse it? What is atonement and how is it related to cleansing of the sanctuary? What are Christ's intercessions? What are the records in heaven and the judgment taking place during this time? Why wait to 1844? So those are the questions we're going to answer. Sound like good questions? Do you know the answers already? I hope, I hope. But I will tell you, these answers were not obvious. They were certainly not obvious in my upbringing in the Adventist church because of the way it's been presented. It's been presented under a layer of, of penal legal uh, processes that are actually not reality. They're fantasy. So the common SDA view, the antitypical day of atonement, what's happening, uh, and re- uh, remember this common view taught by those who hold, or is taught by those who hold the lie that God's law works like human law, is that Christ entered the most holy place in a building in heaven. He began cleansing the sanctuary from the sins of the people, and this began the investigative judgment. All cases professed followers are reviewed. God judges each case, keeping some and rejecting others based on whether sins have been retained in the books. Opening the books and doing this before the heavenly uh, beings vindicates God's judgment. God makes the right rulings based on whether we've made the right legal claims to have the blood of Jesus applied to our books or not. This is how it's been presented. Have you ever heard it presented this way? All my life. Yeah, yeah. Uh, It culminates in the second coming of Christ. The legal view of the atonement is predicated on a single idea that God's law functions like human law or no different than human law. And that's not true. I I want to tell you, I agree with the termination date of 1844, the prophecy of Daniel 8.14 ending in 1844. I agree with the final work of Jesus as our high priest cleansing the heavenly sanctuary before he returns. However, I disagree with the human law interpretation and all the legal elements that have uh, 
obscured the reality that's, that's taking place. So let's look at that now. So what really happens is happening in the heavenly sanctuary. So first question, what is the heavenly sanctuary where Jesus ministers as our high priest? What is it? More specifically, if we use scripture, and for Adventists, since this is the unique, uh, the only truly unique Adventist doctrine, if we use foundational documents from, his, from the historical writings of Ellen White in conjunction with the scripture to help clarify and determine the questions, what is the building material of the heavenly sanctuary? From what is the temple in heaven constructed where Jesus ministers? Well, let's look at scripture. <coughs> Tell him this is what the Lord Almighty says. Here is the man whose name is the branch. Notice it's capitalized. It's referring to Jesus. He will branch out from his place and his place is in heaven and build the temple of the Lord. It is he who will build the temple of the Lord and he will be clothed with majesty and will sit and rule on his throne and he will be a priest on his throne and there will be harmony between the two. Those who are far away will come and help to build the temple of the Lord. And you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. This will happen if you diligently obey the Lord your God. Zechariah 6, 12 to 15. If God's temple was already existence in heaven, then why did God tell the prophet Zechariah that Jesus would leave heaven, leave heaven, to build the temple of the Lord? And that others far away will come and help him build this temple. Is this temple that Jesus is going to build, built by humans? Or is this one not built by humans because it's built by Jesus? Is this not the temple in heaven, the great temple, of which Moses built was just a pattern? Well, let's consider what other scriptures say regarding the temple that Jesus left heaven to build. And you... And you, as you come to him, the living stone, that's Jesus, the living stone, rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. That's 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple. Hey, he's building a temple here in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. 1 Corinthians 3.9 Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him for God's temple is sacred and you are that temple. 1 Corinthians 3.16-17 What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. 2 Corinthians 6, 16. But Christ is faithful as a son over God's house and we are his house. If we hold to our courage and the hope of which we boast, Hebrews 3, 6. The point of what we're saying is this. This is what we're saying. Get the point. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven, and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by man. Hebrews 8, 1 and 2. What is the heavenly sanctuary? What tabernacle was set up by the Lord and not by man? Is it a building made out of non-living matter, gold, silver, dead trees, goat skins, or is it built out of living beings? If the sanctuary already existed in heaven, why did Jesus leave heaven to build it? Why does Jesus need others far away to help him build it? Is this temple that Jesus must build himself one build built by humans or, or by God? Zechariah 6, remember what it said. Tell him 
This is what the Lord Almighty says. Here is the man whose name is the branch, and he will branch out from his place and build the temple of the Lord. It is he who will build the temple of the Lord, and he will be clothed with majesty and will sit and rule on his throne, and he will be a priest on his throne. And there will be harmony between the two. Those who are far away will come and help to build the temple of the Lord, and you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent you. This will happen if you diligently obey the Lord your God. Jesus left heaven to build the sanctuary where God dwells. It is built out of himself as the chief cornerstone with help of the apostles, foundational, those who are far away. And each one of us are to be living stones built together into a house for the Lord. This is why the Bible says, putting all this together, notice some other Bible verses now. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, Psalms 23, 6, or Revelation 3, 12. Him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God, and I will also write on him my new name. We will never leave the temple It's a giant prison where we're locked away in a geographic location for all eternity. That's what it says. We will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and we'll never, we'll be a pillar and we'll never leave it. We don't get to travel the universe. We don't get to see other galaxies. We don't get to visit other places. We're locked in this building. No, we never leave it because we are the building block of the temple. We are pillars of God and we have been brought into unity and our loyalty, our unity, our devotion, our holiness and our oneness with God will never be changed forever. We will never leave that again and break away from him. And now comments from Ellen White, second manuscript release, 339. What we should have been teaching all along. We are God's great building. Every stroke, every stone put into the building is only part of the whole. Every worker is himself to be just what God designs he should be in building his own life with pure, noble, upright deeds, that at the end he may be a symmetrical structure, a fair temple honored by God and man. We must be in this work. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. Through you he has worked and will work to do honor to his name by trusting to to you these great responsibilities. The Lord would have you stand forth as Daniel, every phase of your character under his own ministration. The day by day, that day by day, you may grow into a structure that will stand forth, not as a perfect whole in itself, but connected with the work of other chosen workmen as a beautiful temple for the Lord a living witness to the value, stability, and nobility of the man who keeps his eyes single on the glory of the Lord. But I like this one even better because it specifically contrasts the old and the heavenly. The first tabernacle built according to God's direction was indeed blessed of him. The people were thus preparing themselves to worship in the temple not made with human hands, a temple in the heavens. I think we've laid the case here that we're really now talking about the heavenly sanctuary. It's pretty, pretty explicit here. The stones of the temple built by Solomon were all prepared at the quarry and then brought to the temple site. They came together without sound of axe or hammer. The timbers were also fitted in the forest. The furniture was likewise brought to the house, all prepared for use. Even so, the mighty cleaver of truth has taken out a people from the quarry of the world and fitted this people who professed to be the children of God for a place in his heavenly temple. We want the cleaver of truth to do its work for us. We are taken from the quarry of the world. The material must not be a dead substance, but living souls. And these souls must be brought out of the quarry of the world where the hand of God can fit them for the temple in heaven. We are here as probationers and we must pass under the hand of God. All rough edges and rough surfaces must be removed and we must be stones fitted for the building. We must be stones fitted for the building. We are brought into church capacity with defects of character. We must not retain them. We must be fitted and squared for the building. We must be laborers together with God, for we are God's husbandry. We are God's building. In view of this, we must see that our temple is not defiled with sin. We should be lively stones, not dead ones, but live ones that will reflect the image of Christ 
We must be worshipers in spirit and in truth. From what is the heavenly sanctuary built? Dead matter or living beings? What do you think? So my, our first question, what is the heavenly sanctuary? It is us, built together into a house for the Lord. Second, what is it that contaminates the heavenly sanctuary? When Satan, yes, when he, Satan, lies, he speaks his native language, for he is the liar and the father of lies, John 8, 44. And then Ellen White wrote in Patriarchs and Prophets, from the opening of the great controversy, it has been Satan's purpose to misrepresent God. That means to lie, misrepresent God's character, and to excite rebellion against his law. And this work appears to be crowned with success. Yes, because essentially the whole world, including the Christian world, has accepted the lie. God's law functions no different than human law. A system of made-up rules which makes God out to be the enforcer, the, the, the source of pain and death inflicted as punishment. This is the attack on God's character. And when you believe God's law works like human law, then you believe that God's character is like God's enemy. Signs of the Times, January 20, 1890. God was represented as severe, exacting, revengeful, arbitrary. He was pictured as one who could take pleasure in the suffering of his creatures. The very attributes that belong to the character of Satan, the evil one represented as belonging to the character of God. How is this done? Well, because the law was broken, and justice requires punishment, and God will not let people get away with sin. Somebody has to pay the price, and if you don't accept Jesus' payment, then God is required by law and justice to use his power to torture and kill you. He's severe, he's exacting, he's revengeful, he's arbitrary, makes up rules, made up laws, arbitrary. It's all based on this lie about God's law. Review and Herald, January 5, 1886. Eve believed the words of Satan, and the belief of that falsehood in regard to God's character changed the condition and character of both herself and her husband. They were changed from good and obedient children into transgressors. Understand what this author is describing. Notice what's being described here. This author didn't say that they believed the lies and therefore their actions broke the rules and got them in legal trouble. Now what's been described? Lies believed, remember the cascade? Lies believed break the circle of love and trust. You're in a loving, other-centered marriage where you love and trust your spouse and your spouse loves and trusts you. And somebody you also love and trust, one of your maybe brothers or sisters, comes to you and tells you a lie that your spouse is having an affair. Well, it's not true. While your spouse is still faithful and loyal, if you believe the lie, does something inside of you change? Mm -hmm. Lies believed break the circle of love and trust. Broken love and trust result in fear and selfishness. I don't trust you. I think you're out to get me. I don't think you're a trustworthy person. I think you're looking out for your own interests. I think you're doing things your own way. I think you just make up rules. I think you use power over people. I don't trust you. Therefore, I can't, I can't ha- trust you to have my back. I've got to watch out for me. Lies believe break the circle of love and trust. Broken love and trust result in fear and selfishness. Soon, soon as Adam and Eve sinned, they ran and hid because they were afraid. Fear and selfishness result in destructive actions, what the Bible calls sins. Notice we're three steps down before we get to an action. It's not the deed. The deed is the fruit. Jesus said, you, you, you say if you commit adultery, bad action, you commit sin. I say if you lust in your heart. You say if you commit murder, bad action, you commit sin. I say if you hate in your heart. The deeds are always the manifestation of God's design protocols of love and trust being broken out of the heart and replaced with fear and selfishness. And... Destructive actions or sins damage mind, character, body, relationships. This is a terminal condition. We are dead in trespass and sin. We're born in sin, conceived in it. We're born with a condition we didn't choose. We're not born legally condemned. We're born with a terminal condition. Because we inherited it from Adam. That's why you have to be reborn. And the Bible says, and we're asking, what contaminates the heavenly sanctuary? What contaminates the living stones? Lies about God that we believe, and the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, uh, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. What contaminates the heavenly temple, the heavenly sanctuary? Lies Lucifer told about God that were first believed by the one-third of the angels in heaven and broke their love and trust in the Father and incited rebellion. And then believed by Adam and Eve in Eden and believing those lies resulted in fear and selfishness. It did not cause a legal change. It caused a lethal change. 
their characters were changed. Rather than knowing in heart, in mind, in attitude, in character, rather than knowing in their being by function, trust, love, loyalty, devotion, honesty, fidelity, peace, joy, and the attributes of God, they instead chose to know at the tree of knowledge where you know things. They chose to know distrust, fear, selfishness, guilt, shame, and sin. That's what they chose to know in experience. They changed themselves. Their sanctuaries, their spirit temples were contaminated with a spirit of fear, not the spirit of power and love that we receive from God. Thus, the heavenly sanctuary became contaminated. But because of Adam and Eve's belief in the lies, fear and selfishness replaced the love and trust. They had new spiritual contamination of me first self-centeredness, and that led to actions sinful behaviors that corrupted them and us even more. Bad habits, biases, prejudices, corrupt thinking, lustful and evil passions and choices. That adds to, it's not just the attitude of fear now, we add to it by creating destructive behaviors, habit patterns. And that contaminates our sanctuary, our temple. So what contaminates the heavenly sanctuary? Lies about God. Fear, selfishness, evil desires, lust, carnal nature, the bad habits we develop. What does it mean to cleanse it? Well, David prayed in Psalms 51, wash, me, wash away all my iniquity, cleanse me from sin. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Where does sin happen? In record books or people? In people. Where does God need to do his cleansing work if he is to have a universe where no sin exists? In people, in hearts and mind. If the heavenly sanctuary is built out of living beings, then in order to cleanse the heavenly sanctuary, what needs to happen? Hearts and minds of people need to be cleansed, as David prayed here. And David alludes to this cleansing by using the sanctuary symbols of hyssop. Hyssop was part of the sanctuary system cleansing rituals. And he reaches out and brings that in for his cleansing, recognizing there's a link between his cleansing and the cleansing of the sanctuary. Ellen White makes the following comments. Notice how she builds this up for us. In the cleansing of the temple... Again, back right into the temple. This was Jesus when he went in and threw out the money changer. She's talking about this experience. In cleansing of the temple, Jesus was announcing his mission as the Messiah and entering upon his work. That temple, the one erected out of stone, um, erected for the abode of the divine presence, was designed to be an object lesson for Israel and the world. From eternal ages, it was God's purpose that every created being... God's purpose, every created being from the bright and holy seraph to man should be a temple for the indwelling of the creator. Because of sin, humanity ceased to be the temple for God. Darkened and defiled by evil, the heart of man no longer revealed the glory of the divine one. But by the incarnation of the son of God, the purpose of heaven is fulfilled. God dwells in humanity. And through saving grace, the heart of man becomes again his temple. God designed that the temple at Jerusalem should be a continual witness to the high destiny open to every soul. But the Jews had not understood the significance of the building they regarded with so much pride. They did not yield themselves as holy temples for the divine spirit. The courts of the temple of Jerusalem filled with the tumult of unholy traffic represented all too truly the temple of the heart defiled by the presence of sensual passion and unholy thoughts. In cleansing the temple from the world's buyers and sellers, Jesus announced his mission to cleanse the heart from the defilement of sin, from the earthly desires, the selfish lust, the evil habits that corrupt the soul. The Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. This is quoting Malachi. Even the message of the covenant whom you delight in Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts, but who can abide the day of his coming? Who shall stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and a launderer's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier's silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi or the Levites and purge them as gold and silver. From what does the heavenly sanctuary need cleansing? 
the lies about God that people believe that break trust with God and cause the fear and selfishness and the subsequent corruption of character, the evil thoughts, habits, lusts, passions that form uh, the choices that we make based on the fear and selfishness. The cleansing of the heavenly temple is not some cleansing of a structure built out of gold or legal books by erasing ink marks in books. It only happens by cleansing hearts and minds of people from sin. That is why we're to bring every thought into captivity to Jesus Christ. Our minds must be set right. Notice Ellen White quotes from Malachi, the prophecy that tells us that Jesus comes to his temple. And the prophecy in Malachi says specifically that he comes to his temple to cleanse, to purify. And it tells us specifically he comes to purify the Levites, which are the priesthood of believers. That's the prophecy. Do you think Malachi's prophecy of Jesus coming to his temple for a cleansing work and specifically calls out he's coming to cleanse the, the Levites, the priesthood of believers, do you think that's a different cleansing prophecy than Daniel 8.14? Or is that the exact same prophecy of Daniel 8.14, that 2,300 days in the sanctuary be cleansed? Same or different? Well, and White had an opinion about this. Sadly, it appears that the legalists in the camp after 1888 didn't appreciate her opinion because it certainly hasn't been taught in in the system that I was raised in. Here's what her opinion was. And it's written in, in a book maybe some of you heard about called The Great Controversy, page 426. The coming of Christ as our high priest to the most holy place for the cleansing of the sanctuary brought to view in Daniel 814. The coming of the Son of Man to the Ancient of Days as presented in Daniel 713. The coming of the Lord to his temple foretold by Malachi are descriptions of the same event. And this is also represented by the coming of the bridegroom to the marriage described by Christ in the parable of the ten virgins. Let it sink in what I'm saying here, folks. Next question, what is atonement? And how is it related to cleansing of the sanctuary? The day of atonement, cleansing of the sanctuary concept is derived directly from the Jewish feast days. The purpose of the ceremonial symbolic system was to teach the plan of salvation, to teach the reality of what Jesus would do for us. But if there is no reality to which a metaphor or symbol points, then it's no longer a metaphor or symbol, it's fantasy. In order to be a metaphor or a symbol, it has to actually point to something in reality. And, it's, and the purpose of metaphor and symbol is to enlighten us and help us comprehend reality. That's its purpose. Again, if there's no reality to which it's pointing, then it becomes fantasy. And that is what has happened to the teaching of this beautiful symbolism of the sanctuary. It becomes fantasy when we teach it through human-imposed law concepts. It's not reality. God's government does not work like human governments. That's fantasy. There is not one element in the Old Testament sanctuary that is meant to be taken literally. Every single element is a symbol of something else in reality. Hebrews 9, 10, uh, 9 and 10, uh, and 10, 3 and 4. The gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshipers. They're only a matter of food and drink and very ceremonial washings, external regulations applying to the time of the new order. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. That Old Testament symbolic system, in that system there were seven annual feasts and they were theatrical. It was a play. Understand that old system. They had a really neat stage with cool props, expensive props made out of gold, neat costumes, (coughs) <coughs> and a script. We call that script scripture. Scripture. It was a script. That's what it was. It was a play. Why was it a play? Because when they came out of Egypt and God gave this to them, first off, Moses hadn't written the books yet, so there was no books for them to read. Most of them were former slaves, probably couldn't really read anyway. And even if Moses had written the books and they could read, there was no printing presses and there was no way to actually make copies so everyone could have it home to read. And so God instead instituted another way to teach through symbols. See, when you read words, words are symbols. 
when you see the word justification, justification is a symbol of an idea. You are not justified because you read the word justification. It's just a symbol of an idea. You have to experience the reality of what that, what that symbol is pointing you toward. And the Old Testament sanctuary system was all types of symbols acted out to point people to reality. And that's where salvation occurs in the reality, not in the symbols. And so he was, it was a big teaching tool for a group of people who most likely were mostly illiterate at that time. And there, even if they weren't, there weren't anything scriptures for them to read yet. So it was, it was, this was set up for their, for their benefit to, as an educational system, but it's all theatrical. God, and, and, and in that theatrical system, there were seven feast days that occurred in an annual recurring cycle. Every year they started at the beginning and they worked through seven of them and they started back again every year. And they're still keeping them. Many of the Jewish people, they're still observing these seven annual feast days. And these were designed to teach the plan of salvation from Adam's fall all the way to the earth made new. That's what the seven annual feast days were designed to teach from the fall to the restoration. The first in the series was the Passover. As soon as humanity fell into sin, Adam and Eve sinned, God passed over their sins. As it says in Romans, he left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Christ is the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. The, the, the Passover Lamb was already there, taking the responsibility to fix the problem for us. The time in human history covered by the Passover festival was Adam's fall until Jesus' victory at the cross, Passover weekend. And then the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which occurred simultaneously with the Passover feast. The Unleavened Bread, uh, God immediately after the fall, began dispensing truth, unmixed with error, the unleavened bread, the bread of truth, the word, to nurture and save, but it was internal, nurture and save as it's internalized, taken into the heart and mind, by those with sin, but it had to be taken in with bitter herbs in the symbol because now we are in sin and life is bitter to us because of the sin we're in as we're taking in the truth. This is also represented from the, uh, the time of Adam's fall until Christ's victory. Eating the unleavened bread symbolizes internalizing the word that was made flesh. And then the feast of first fruits also occurred on the week in Pass Passover time. The first fruits were the victory over, over death. The wave sheaf represents Jesus, the ultimate first fruit, who was buried and rose again in sinless perfection. Those who arose with him on resurrection morning uh, are uh, part of the first fruits uh, in reality. The Feast of Weeks, Pentecost, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit to apply what Christ achieved and bring forth a harvest of healed souls. This occurred after Christ's death on the cross as the benefits of his achievement were dispensed to trusting human hearts. Symbolically spans the time of Pentecost, AD 31, until the loud cry. The trumpets, a special message for the end time. It's the loud cry, the awakening. Awake, prepare, get ready, it's time. Jesus is coming soon. It's uh, announcing the, the a Day of Atonement uh, festival. This is the late 18th and early 19th century, the Great Awakening in Christianity and the Millerite Movement. The Day of Atonement, re reunification with God, oneness with him. This is healing and restoration of Christ-like character within, a settling into the truth from which one cannot be shaken. This is, uh, began from the mid-19th century until the second coming of Christ. And then the final feast in this series is Tabernacles. After we have been restored to Unity at one minute in heart, mind, and character, sealed and settled. Christ returns, and we tabernacle with him again in an earth made new, our new Eden home, garden home for eternity. That's why in that feast they made those green little huts, and they would go spend in the hut, symbolically representing the earth made new, the Eden home again. Just as the Old Testament Passover feast had a real and literal fulfillment when Jesus died as our Passover lamb on Passover Friday, just as the Feast of Unleavened Bread had a real and literal fulfillment in Jesus being the Word made flesh uh, and undefiled by the leaven of sin, just as the Feast of first fruits had a real and literal fulfillment in Jesus rising from the dead and raising those first people we read about in Acts who went to heaven with him in his resurrection, had a real and literal fulfillment, and just as the P Feast of Pentecost had a real and literal fulfillment, uh, when the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in this uh, AD 31, and just as the Feast of Trumpets had a real and literal fulfillment in the loud cry and the message of the Millerites, Jesus is coming soon, 
so too there is a real and literal cleansing, uniting, bonding, and bringing to unity at one moment that takes place between Jesus and his people before he returns. And we are living in that time right now. That's where we're living. So understand this lesson. Uh, we, we real, uh, understanding this lesson, we realize that Jesus is now fulfilling the reality to which the Day of Atonement Feast pointed. And we have to understand what, that, what is that reality. If we have the human law lie in our heads, we teach a false theory of legal adjusting, reviewing records, and making legal payments. But when we return to design law, we realize the truth that Jesus is accomplishing what he prayed in John 17 to his Father to be accomplished, to bring all things into unity, that they will, we will all be one with him and the Father as they are one. And that's what he's doing, at one minute. And we read in Ephesians 1, 3, 9, and 10, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. God's mystery, the plan to remove sin and restore all things to unity, to at oneness, when the times have reached their fulfillment, when the longest Bible time prophecy has reached its fulfillment. The great controversy quote we cited from Ellen White, remember? Here it is. The coming of Christ as our high priest to the most holy place for the cleansing of the sanctuary brought to view in Daniel 8, 14, 2300 years and the sanctuary will be cleansed. The coming of the Son of Man of the ancient days of Daniel 7, 13. The coming of the Lord to his temple foretold by Malachi are descriptions of the same event. And this is also represented by the coming of the bridegroom to the marriage. Atonement is when two become one at one meant. And when two are united in love and trust and become one, that's a wedding. That's a marriage. And a marriage is also the same event as the cleansing of the sanctuary. The wedding imagery. Return, O backslidden Israel, says the Lord, for I am married to you. You are alienated from me. We are not one. I'm your husband, but you have broken trust with me. You have been adulterous. You have betrayed me. Come back and let me cleanse you so we can be one again at one minute. For your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. He is called the God of all the earth, Isaiah 54, 5, or 2 Corinthians eleven two. 2. Paul's writing, I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. A marriage as God designed is not a legal declaration but an intertwining of hearts, minds, and selves into a greater whole. It is a holy union. The two become united upon bonds of love and trust, whereas the collective of the two become one in a fashion that defies earthly description. And together they are more than either one by themselves. Yes or no? Yes. But a whole, healthy, holy marriage requires... Healthy, holy people. So in order for us to enter into full unity at one mint, the oneness Jesus prayed for, we must be purified, cleansed, made holy. And I'm going to read you another comment from Ellen White. And this comment, I want to set the setting, she's writing in the aftermath of the Great Disappointment to people who were not Seventh-day Adventists because Seventh-day Adventist Church wasn't established until 1863, these were the Advent people looking for the second coming of Christ in 1844 and were greatly disappointed. What do you think is she is really saying here? This is early writings, 251. Jesus sent his angels to direct the minds of the disappointed ones, those who after 1844 were disappointed, to the most holy place where he had gone to cleanse the sanctuary and make a special atonement for Israel. Jesus told the angels that all who found him would understand the work which he was to perform. 
I saw that while Jesus was in the most holy place, he would be married to the new Jerusalem. He's going to the holy place to do his cleansing work, his atonement work. While he's there, he gets married to the new Jerusalem. <coughs> because two become one, are united. And after his work should be accomplished in the holiest, he would descend to the earth in kingly power and take, him, take to himself the precious ones who had patiently waited for his return. Who or what is the bride of Christ? Who or what? Who or what? Well, look at the scriptures. Revelation 19, 6 through 9. Hallelujah, for the Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. Then the angel said to me, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Notice there is a wedding and there is a wedding supper or a wedding celebration. The wedding itself is the in, uniting in loving commitment of heart, mind, soul, spirit of two spouses. The wedding celebration or supper follows the joining. But the wedding, the uniting of Christ, cannot happen with us. We cannot be united if we in heart mind, spirit, soul, don't trust him. If we're still in rebellion against him. If we prefer lies, prefer selfishness, prefer the methods of Satan to those of our Savior. So in order for that at one moment, that unity to happen, in order for us to be bonded, sealed, settled into eternal unity, Jesus must cleanse our hearts and minds. Bring us back into unity. And when do the saints, think this through with me, when do the saints experience their hearts being bonded into unshakable, loyal love to Jesus before or at the second coming? And when do the saints experience the cleansing of their hearts, being reborn, recreated, renewed from fear, selfishness, guilt, and shame to new creatures in Christ before or at the second coming? This is the wedding. The wedding, the uniting the work in the most holy place taking place, settling and sealing the people of God into their eternal loyalty to him. In Revelation 21, keep going. Then I saw the new heaven and the new earth, for in the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Why is the New Jerusalem described as the Bride of Christ? It is symbolic. Jesus is not getting married to buildings. Amen. Jesus is being united with his people. And thus he is cleansing his people from fear, selfishness, sin, distrust, shame, guilt, sealing them into eternal loyalty to him. The New Jerusalem is symbolic of the most holy place where the atonement takes place or the unity or the wedding takes place. Notice the similarities of the most holy place and the New Jerusalem. The most holy place is in the shape of a cube. The New Jerusalem is in the shape of a cube. It's all spelled out with, 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 uh, in scripture. You can look this up. The most holy place was covered in gold. The new Jerusalem is paved in gold. The most holy place had three tribes camp on each of its four sides. The new Jerusalem has three gates on each of its four sides with the names of the 12 tribes on the gates. The most holy place was lighted by the Shekinah of God's presence. The new Jerusalem is lighted by God's presence. The most holy place, in the most holy place, was a covenant box where the symbolic covenant of cleansing, uniting, was accomplished. In the New Jerusalem are the saints in whom the real covenant of cleansing, uniting, and bonding has been accomplished. Symbolisms of the most holy place. 
The symbolism is the universe cleansed of sin, reconciled back to oneness with God. We just read about all things being united to Christ under one head. The Shekinah in the most holy place represents God. The angels on the lid of the ark represent the unfallen beings. And then there's the lid. The lid was made out of a solid gold and is specifically referred to by Paul, the hilasterion, which is the lid, as Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the lid. Perfect, pure gold. Notice that Jesus Christ is the connecting link between heaven above, the angels, and the Shekinah. Heaven above, they are connected to Jesus on the lid, and earth below. And earth below is the box. And what's the box represent? As we look at the box, the box was porous wood covered in gold. The porous wood represents sinful human beings, and the gold, the purity of Christ, united back with God. Wood symbolizes man, grown from the dirt of the earth. A tree, the wood, grown from the dirt of the earth, symbolizes man formed out of the dirt of the earth. But to be part of the holy box, the wood had to be cut free of its roots that tie it to the earth and then covered in gold. And we must be cut free of all the earthliness and covered in the gold or the purity of Christ. And then we can be part of the box, part of the new kingdom, part of the new covenant. And in the box, there were three elements that were placed and they were placed in a certain order. And this box represents the, your heart and my heart if you have cut, allowed the Holy Spirit to circumcise your heart and cut away your attachments to earthly things and you've accepted the righteousness of Christ, then you're represented by the box. And there's three things that go in the box. And they went in a certain order. The first thing that went in is the manna. And the manna represents Jesus. If you would have it, he said, I am the bread of heaven that has come down. And he is the word made flesh. And we are to internalize the word. And as the, the literal bread that you take in becomes building blocks of your physical body, the word of truth, Jesus is the truth, as we take in the word of truth of Jesus, it becomes building blocks to our, our belief systems, our understanding, our schemas, our perspectives. And as we take in Jesus, the truth dispels the lies and wins us to trust. And when we open our heart to trust because we've partaken of the word, Jesus, then the law is written upon our hearts and minds. The next thing that went in the box was the Ten Commandments. And the Holy Spirit comes in and we are reborn with a new motive, the law written on our hearts and minds. And once we have re restored to trust in Jesus and had the law written on our hearts and minds, the third thing, which was Aaron's dead rod that came to life, budded and sprouted and brought forth fruit. Almonds, we who are dead in trespass and sin come to life and bring forth the peaceable fruits of righteousness. This is what is taught. And it happens in a certain direction. We must partake of Christ. We must be one to trust. We must have the old law of sin and death replaced with the law of love and trust. And then we live new lives with new motives and we bring out the fruits of righteousness. So the city also had a foundation with the name of the 12 apostles. Remember Jesus left heaven? to build a temple with the foundation of the 12 apostles. And the new Jerusalem is the cube of the most holy place where he is building. And the city had the foundation. The most holy places where the high priest conducted a special ceremony once a year. The ceremony of atonement, the ceremony of cleansing, the ceremony of washing away of sin and purifying people. The bride, the ceremony of bringing the people into at one with God, the two becoming one. In other words, a wedding ceremony. And this ceremony happened at the end of the annual cycles, right before the Feast of Tabernacles, where we tabernacle and celebrate with God. The cleansing of Christ's bride and the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary are the same event. Remember the quote. Daniel 8, 14, Malachi chapter 3, the wedding all teach the same event. And so John Understand the wedding, the cleansing, and the day of atonement teach the same event. So John wrote in Revelation, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Amen. And John wrote in Revelation, He who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, New Jerusalem. We are the living stones built together in a house for the Lord, the new Jerusalem, the new city of peace, where we are all at peace with the Lord again, which is coming down out of heaven. And I'll also write on him a new name. And this is why God writes his name on us, which is his character. 
And the Bible connects this restoration of the image of God, God's name in us, with the unity or at oneness of being uh, from those who are apart coming back into unity, which is the temple, which is the new Jerusalem. And the bride, his name written on us, takes the name of her husband. The character of Jesus. That's the name. What are Christ's intercessions? So what does Jesus' intercessions in the heavenly sanctuary in our behalf mean then? If, all, if, if I'm right so far, are you still with me or have I lost you? Okay, all right. Because there's a lot of information. But, I, but, but I'm trying to present this in a way where you see the connecting links. This is all connected. It's one story in Scripture. Okay? So then what about Christ's intercessions then? I'm sure you've heard about Christ's intercessions, right? He has to plead his blood in the heavenly court to earn merit or favor so we aren't condemned. That's the penal legal model. That's not true. But we do have this statement in Hebrews 7.25. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. What law lens are you looking through? If human law, then the problem is we're in legal trouble and God is required by law and justice to punish us for our sin crimes, so we need a defense attorney to intercede in our behalf and make a payment of some sort to the ruling authority so that the ruling authority won't have to kill us. That's all fantasy. It's not reality. This view that I just described is at best childish, immature, infantile. As Hebrews chapter 5 says, it's not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. That's its best view. It's worst is that it's a counterfeit that tricks people into false security that make them feel like they have righteousness when they, when they don't. So what's the truth, the design law view of how it functions? Well, where does sin happen? In people. Who is the accuser of the people? Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Who listens to Satan's allegations and accusations? Who's listening? Who gives him credit? Who gives him the time of day? Do, do you think in heaven God and the holy angels are actually going, well, you know, I think Satan's got a point there. You know, yeah, yeah, that's a good one. I, you know what? I, I hadn't thought of that one. That, 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 you know, we might have to listen to him on this one. Do you think that's actually happening in heaven? No. Okay. Not anymore. Not since the cross. That's right. At the cross, all questions in the heavenly realms were settled. And Jesus said, I, I, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all unto me. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the prince of this world will be cast out. And I'll draw all unto me. He cast, Satan was cast out of all the affection because they, he exposed himself as a fraud and a liar and a murderer at the cross. So in heaven, they're not listening to him. He gets no traction. His allegations have no value. They have no meaning. So who's listening? Who's listening? Who gives him credit? Who gives him airtime in their heads? So then who does Jesus need to intercede with? That's exactly right. It's in our hearts and minds that Jesus is interceding through his representative, the Holy Spirit. Remember he said, it's expedient for you that I go. If I don't go, the Spirit won't come. But when the Spirit or the Comforter comes, he won't speak on his own. He'll speak only what he hears. Remember Jesus said this? And he's listening to Jesus. Jesus is in heaven as our human head representative, second Adam, representing all of us in God's kingdom, taking the place where Adam was originally intended to stand in God's great council. And he's there pleading for every one of us. And the Holy Spirit hears his pleas and whispers them in your heart. And so consider this quotation from Ellen White describing these intercessions. As Satan accused Joshua and his people, so in all ages he accuses those who, see, who are seeking the mercy and favor of God. In, Re in the Revelation, he is declared to be the accuser of our brethren, which accused them before God day and night. The controversy is repeated over every soul that is rescued from the power of evil and whose name is registered in the Lamb's Book of Life. Never is one received from the family of Satan into the family of God without exciting the determined resistance of the wicked one. Satan's accusations against those who seek the Lord are not prompted by displeasure of their sins. He exalts in their defective, defective characters. Only through their transgressions of God's law can he obtain power over them. Did you hear that? Oh, think that through. He has power as we practice his methods, in other words. Because we habituate his methods and principles into our lives if we practice them. He accus his accusations arise solely from his enmity to Christ. Through the plan of salvation, Jesus is breaking Satan's hold upon 
the human family and rescuing souls from his power. All the hatred and malignity of the arch rebel is stirred as he beholds the evidence of Christ's supremacy. And with fiendish power and cunning work, he, he, he works to wrest from him the remnant of the children of men who have accepted his salvation. Where do you think such a battle is taking place? Where is the work of Jesus occurring that will rescue a sinner from Satan's power? Where is Jesus working to get a sinner rescued? Is he working with his father? Father, please, will you? Or is he working to get you and me to choose him? Where does Satan's power of lies and selfishness occur? Again, who's listening to the lies and accusations of Satan? Who would Christ need to plead with to persuade them that his sacrifice is sufficient? Your sins have not gone too far. I can heal you. I will restore you. Won't you trust me? Don't listen to the lie that you've gone too far. <coughs> Continue with the quote. He, Satan, leads men into skepticism, leads men into skepticism, causing them to lose confidence in God and to separate from his love. Again, who's listening to the accusation? Satan is not getting the beings in heaven to make some legal ruling against us. He's getting us to doubt. He's getting us to fear. He's getting us to break away our love and trust. And so Christ is pleading, don't give up. Trust me. Don't listen to your feelings. Don't listen to the guilt. Trust me. I'll heal you if you stick with me. He tempts them to break his law, and then he claims them as his captives and contests the right of Christ to take them from him. He knows that those who seek God earnestly for pardon and grace will obtain it. Therefore, he presents their sins before them to discourage them. Notice the dynamic here. The author does not say that Satan knows that he can find a sin that the person committed that they somehow forgot to confess and ask forgiveness for, that it remains in the legal registry in heaven, and God will be forced to pronounce them guilty even though the patient person is, has repented because it was not actually removed from the legal registry and the law requires their death nail. This is not what the author is describing. Satan knows that all who trust God will, as Isaiah 55 says, receive free pardon. God pardons freely and grace that heals and restores them and gives them a new heart and right spirit and empowers them to live new lives. So Satan accuses the sinner to the sinner to discourage the repentant sinner, tempting them to give up and let go of their faith. So again, where is Christ pleading? To whom? This is his pleading. He, Satan, is constantly seeking occasion against those who are trying to obey God. Even their best and most acceptable service, he seeks to make appear corrupt. The repentant sinner is being tempted. Yeah, well, yeah, she went and helped that person. But then you look to see if anyone noticed. You didn't really care about those people. You only cared to see if you get credit. Why do you even try to help people? And on and on. You know how it goes. Satan is trying to twist everything to make you doubt and fear and just give up. <coughs> By countless devices, the most subtle and most cruel, Satan endeavors to secure their condemnation. He's, he's endeavoring to secure our condemnation from who? Do you think he's trying to get God to condemn us? No, Rome is No, he's not. No, so he's, say, Satan is seeking our condemnation from who? From ourselves that we condemn ourselves as hopeless. And I can tell you, I see patients like this. I've gone too far. I've done too much. I'm too broken. I'm too damaged. I'm too sinful. I've done too much, too horrible. I can't be saved. I've asked repentance too many times. 70 times seven, it's over. I did my 490, it's over. That's one of Satan's most powerful temptations. Yeah, it's an it, argument it, he used with the angels in heaven? Yep, he did use this argument. With, You've gone too far. You can't go back. I know exactly. God, I he won't forgive you. Yeah, I know God, he won't forgive you. And so this is, this is where, and so Christ is pleading, if you trust me, I can heal you. If you trust me, I can heal you. This is his intercession. He's intercessing, inter, interceding in the most holy place, which is built out of living beings to heal and cleanse us from all of this garbage. Man cannot meet the charges himself. In his sin-stained garments, confessing his guilt, he stands before God. This is exactly right. We don't stand before God and say, I don't need Jesus. I can cure my own sin condition. In fact, I really haven't sinned. I'm righteous in my own strength. No, 
we stand before God the Father and say, Father, I acknowledge I was born in sin, conceived in iniquity. I was born with a terminal sin condition. I didn't choose it. But this condition I've had has had many symptoms along the way, many shortcomings, many sins, from, uh, many fallings from your glorious ideal. I, I have been fearful and selfish and acted out against your law. I have no ability to change my heart, to heal my condition. I confess I am dead in trespass and sin. I am only here before you because Jesus overcame where I could never overcome. And Jesus has gifted me his victory. His mind, his heart, his love, his motives, his character. And it is no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me through his dwelling, indwelling spirit. This is, this is where we stand. We don't stand. Uh, we don't meet the charges. We accept the condition that we were born with, and we accept the Savior who gives us a new condition. And notice what comes next. But Jesus, our advocate, presents an effectual plea. In behalf of all who by repentance and faith have committed the keeping of their souls to him, he pleads their cause and vanquishes their accuser by the mighty arguments of Calvary. For all who acknowledge their condition, Jesus pleads effectively to them. My grace is sufficient for you. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I have engraved you on the palms of my hand. My victory is your victory. Trust me and I will make you whole. The accusations of Satan that we are too sinful to be saved are vanquished with his effectual plea as we listen and trust him. His perfect obedience to God's law, even unto death of the cross, has given him all power in heaven and earth, and he claims of his father mercy and reconciliation for guilty man. Whose mercy? God's mercy. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. <laughs> to procure the remedy and fix the problem. Jesus, with all power in heaven and earth, to distribute to us the grace and mercy of God, to heal the damage in our heart. He doesn't win God's mercy. He claims and distributes God's mercy. The accuser of his people, to the, to the accuser of his people, he declares, the Lord rebuke you, Satan, these are the purchase of my blood, brands plucked from the burning. Jesus doesn't plead his blood to the Father. Jesus rebukes Satan and refutes his allegations. And listen to what Jesus says next. Those who rely upon him in faith receive the comforting assurance. Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee. I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. He removes from us the fear, the guilt, the shame, the selfishness, the sin condition, and gives us a new heart and right spirit. He writes his law of love in our inmost beings so that it is no longer our old sinful self, but Christ lives in us. We are reconciled, brought to oneness. We know God. The fact that the acknowledged people of God are represented as standing before the Lord in filthy garments should lead to humility and deep searching of heart on the part of all who profess his name. Those who are indeed purifying their souls by obeying the truths will have a most humble opinion of themselves. This is part of the investigative judgment, the investigation of our own hearts and minds and characters in light of God's grace and truth, investigating the truth about who God is and the truth of what Christ has provided and his trustworthiness and reliability so that we align with him and are reconciled to him. And then the more closely they view the spotless character of Christ, the stronger will be their desire to be conformed to his image. And the less they will see of, uh, and the less will they see of purity and holiness in themselves. But while we should realize our sin, sinful condition, we are to rely upon Christ as our righteousness, our sanctification, and our redemption. We cannot answer the charges of Satan against us. Christ alone can make an effectual plea in our behalf. He is able to silence the accuser with arguments founded not upon our merits, but upon his own. Five Testimonies 471. Jesus is interceding in the most holy place at this time in history with your heart in mind to get us to truly trust him and stop listening to the lies of the devil and seal us or settle us into our eternal loyalty and faithfulness to him. What are the records in heaven and the judgment taking place during this time? What are their heavenly records? Parchments, books, data recording systems? Hebrews 12, 22 and 23. But you have come to Mount Zion, 
the heavenly Jerusalem, that's the most holy place, the city of the living God, you have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. Or Revelation 21, 27, nothing impure will ever enter it, New Jerusalem, the most holy place, nor will anyone who does, not, who, who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Or Daniel 12, 1. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Or Revelation 3, 5. He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my father and the angels. In scripture... What does name symbolize? Character. Your character. That's exactly right. What is written in the records of heaven? The names of the righteous. And in the Bible, the names represent character. So it's our individualities, our unique personhood. We who have chosen to become in heart, mind, character, based on our choices to accept Christ or reject Christ. Our true individuality is what is recorded there. Thus, the work of Jesus in the record is merely the metaphorical way of describing the reality of Jesus' work in cleansing our hearts and minds from fear, selfishness, distrust, guilt, shame, and all the evil habits to reconcile us or purify us to be like him. So purifying the records is purifying your characters, in other words. And you should understand the records as medical records. What, what, if you want to change somebody's medical record, the only legitimate way to do it is to actually change their health condition. Amen. Wow. And so Ellen White's comments. Remember, your character is being daguerreotyped. That's the 19th century way of saying a photograph. Okay? <laughs> Remember, your character is being photographed by the great master artist in the record books of heaven, as minutely as the face is reproduced in the polished plate of the artist. What do the books of heaven say in your case? Are you conforming your character to the pattern of Jesus Christ? Are you washing your robes of character and making them white in the blood of the Lamb? Uh, manuscript Release, Volume 5, Letter 51. Or this one. Remember that this world is God's daguerreotype or photograph office. The pictures of all who live here, old and young, are being made in the books of heaven. What shall the likeness be? I mean, this is not a new message, folks. But this is not what we were taught, was it? But this has always been the truth. What is the cleansing of the sanctuary? The final removal of all the defects from the characters of the people who have trusted Jesus. It is the sealing, the settling, both intellectually and spiritually, of the saints into eternal loyalty to God so that nothing will shake them from it. The wedding, the uniting, the bonding of heart to Jesus, making us pure people at one, united with him. That is what is happening. Amen. What is the judgment? There are four judgments in Scripture. The first to apply to the cleansing of the sanctuary. The, the last two come after, and we won't discuss the last two this morning because we're really, really running late. The first judgment, Satan lied about God. Jesus reveals the truth about God. We must judge. Is God like Satan says, or is God like uh, Jesus revealed? This was all through history. Adam and Eve had to make that judgment in Eden. At Mount Carmel, uh, the people had to decide if God is like Yahweh, worship him. If he's like Baal, worship him. Uh, this judgment is our determination uh, of whether God is trustworthy, and it determines whether we choose to trust God and open our hearts or not. Amen. And this is why Paul wrote in Romans 3, verse 4. This is the New King James. Let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. It has always been a question of God's trustworthiness in the controversy, and we have to decide in this time, we have to decide, is God the creator, the one who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of water? Is, are his laws the design laws? Or is God a Roman dictator, makes up rules and then uses power to kill people, and we got to pay him off with the blood of a human sacrifice so he won't kill us? Which God are we worshiping? We have to make that decision. And that determines, by, by beholding, we become changed. We become like the God we worship, and it determines whether we really trust him or we trust the mechanics, the payments, and the intercessions that are going on to protect us from the God because we, really we really don't trust him. So the first judgment is our judgment of God. The second judgment is God's diagnostic and therapeutic judgments to deal with the sin problem 
and bringing the promised Messiah of Genesis 3.15. And these have been going on through history, and there's another application going on in the sanctuary. We understand design law, that after Adam and Eve sinned, they had this lethal problem, and God diagnosed therapeutically, judged what was wrong, and began intervening uh, in earth's history to bring therapeutic judgments to keep open the avenue for Messiah. That's the flood. Those are the uh, plagues of Egypt and many other interventions. These are all therapeutic to uh, keep open the avenue for Messiah and bring the healing plan. And there's another aspect, though, of God's healing therapeutic judgments rather than just keeping open avenue for Messiah, and that is his diagnostic work in each individual heart and mind. And David understood this and prayed, examine me, O God, and know my mind. Test me and discover my thoughts. Find out if there is an evil thing in me, evil in me, and guide me in the way everlasting. So there's this other aspect of investigation or judgment, which is diagnostic and therapeutic, where God examines our hearts and minds to identify the elements that need to be removed and replaced with righteousness. And this is what we see in Malachi 3, 1 through 5. The same, the investigative judgment, the cleansing of the sanctuary. Notice again, we'll read the whole thing. But then suddenly the Lord you're seeking will come to his temple. The message of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can adore the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness. And the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord as it is in days gone by, as in former years, so I will come near you for judgment. Notice what he's judging. He's diagnosing what's wrong and he's fixing it. These are therapeutic judgments. This is the judgment of the great physician diagnosing what's wrong and determining what's best, what's therapeutic. God brings judgments upon rebellious people throughout history to alert, to convict, to redeem, to protect, to redirect, and all those actions we see through the Old Testament. And Jesus' work in the heavenly sanctuary to identify a judge who has trusted him and given him access to their life. Because God, while God has the power to reach into any heart and mind and make changes, he has the power to do it. If he did it without your cooperation, consent, and willingness, he erases your individuality and replaces you with either a robot or somebody else. The only way to save you as an individual is with your cooperation and permission and your power of choice. And that's why he first assesses, do you trust me? Do you open your heart to me? I stand at the door and knock. I'm knocking. I want to come in. I want to fix things up. I want to clean things out. Will you let me? Will you work with me? Will you agree with me? Will you choose with me? Yes, that's how it's a cooperative effort. He does the work, but we do the choosing and the trusting. What residual ele- and also what residual elements of sin remain to be removed in order to perfect us for the resurrection and the second coming. Why wait to 1844? Is this ever, have you ever wondered this one? Because of how reality works. Because God is the creator. His laws are design laws. And his cleansing is the cleansing of hearts and minds of people from lies, fear, selfishness, and that requires the truth be presented and we freely choose it. God cannot win love, trust, loyalty, devotion, friendship by the use of external might and power. Not by might nor by power, but by the way the Spirit works. And he cannot get this by the external use of energy and power. He has to win us to trust in order for that. And, the, and we are in a war Although we live in the world, we don't wage wars, the world does. The weapons we use are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. There's a war going on in our minds, in our hearts. The Bible foretold that Jesus, uh, after Jesus, Jesus finished his work on earth and ascended back to heaven, Satan would counterattack the people of God and wage war on the people of God. Daniel 7, 21 and 22, I beheld, and the same horn made war. And this war is a war over arguments and pretensions and the knowledge of God, misrepresenting God, lying about God, getting us to accept that God is an imperial dictator, that God's law works like human law. Until the Ancient of Days and judgment was given, given, judgment given, imparted. Judgment, discernment, the ability to differentiate right from wrong, to understand the truth from a lie. The, the, this, this horn power is winning until we receive the ability to tell the difference. Well, how does God give us the ability to tell the difference? Paul wrote 
Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness, this is the same man of the little horn power, the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he, now get this goes, sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. The temple must be cleansed because there's a counterfeit God operating in the living temple. This happened. And what temple needs to be cleansed? The spirit temple. How did Satan set himself up in God's temple? By changing how we view God's law from design law to impose law. You accept any part of God's law works like human law, then you're worshiping a creature. You're not worshiping the creator. And you will always conclude that God's justice requires God to use power to kill. And thus death is God's power to wield. When the Bible says that Jesus took upon himself human flesh, they might destroy him who holds the power of death that is the devil. And the last enemy to be destroyed, Paul writes, is death and Christ destroys that enemy. And Jesus came to, bring, um, to destroy death and bring life and immortality to light, he wrote to Timothy. But if you hold the imposed law model, you have God wielding death, which is Satan's power. Christ destroys it. So he sets himself up in God's temple, getting us to worship a Roman dictator form of God who makes up rules and new power to kill, and by presenting God as this dictator, cosmic executioner, source of death. Thus the world goes into an age of darkness, and God's ability to cleanse, pe- uh, cleanse his people has been obstructed. So the 2300-year prophecy is, di- is the vision that God gave to his friend Daniel, looking down the corridors of time. He tells Daniel, 490 years, 70 weeks, 77s remain for your people to fulfill their mission to be the avenue for the Messiah. In the middle of that last week, the Messiah will come and he'll put an end to the ceremonial system of sacrifices and achieve the victory Uh, uh, over sin and reconcile the species human to God. But after Jesus finishes his work on earth and returns to heaven, Satan counters the work of Jesus and introduces a false interpretation and meaning of what Christ has accomplished. The little horn power wars against the saints. And this war is not primarily physical. It is the war of lies about God. And the man of sin, the man of lawlessness, will set himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. And the hearts and minds of people uh, will be darkened. And because of this false God being enthroned in the spirit temple as the God who is worshipped, it would be 2,300 years from now, from, from from the decree to rebuild and restore Jerusalem before enough truth is recovered to cleanse the spirit temple, the hearts and minds of people, and prepare them for the second coming. Thus, it'll be 2,300 years before the sanctuary can be cleansed, before the truth of God is uh, that God is not an imperial dictator who makes up rules and uses power to kill rule breakers is, is recovered. It will be that long before the Bible is translated into the language of the people and not hidden away by the religious leaders. It will be that long before the Bible is printed and distributed in enough languages that people can actually study for themselves and come to their own conclusion and see the truth as Jesus revealed God to be. It will be that long before the false system of Babylon as is exposed as a system of imperial dictatorship and rules and a punishing and extorted God, extorting God. And it'll be that long till we return to worship him who made the heavens and the earth that we can actually judge God to be like Jesus revealed him to be. That's why it's 2,300 years. If the spirit temple, and we're almost done, if the spirit temple is the one that's defiled, then how is it cleansed? Malachi 3, 1 through 3. It's cleansed by the truth of of Jesus Christ, being one to trust, opening the heart, and having the Holy Spirit bring us the new motives of Christ. He is purifying the Levites. You only cleanse the heavenly temple by cleansing the living stones that the heavenly temple is built from. The only way to do it. And that's why, in Revelation, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. God and Jesus, the Lamb, are the temple, and we dwell forever as pillars Pillars in the temple because we are pillars of righteousness, pillars of holiness, pillars of Christ-likeness, pillars of friendship, pillars of loyalty. We stand solid in a united relationship wedded to Jesus Christ at one with him for all eternity. So in summary, we'll just summarize these and be done. What is the heavenly sanctuary? The unity built by God out of living beings. What contaminates it? Lies about God and our own sinfulness. What does it mean to cleanse it? To remove the lies and the fear 
and selfishness and restore trust in Jesus, his character, love, truth, freedom, holiness, righteousness, so that we become the righteousness of God. What is atonement and how is it related to cleansing the sanctuary? Bringing us into unity, at one moment with God, the wedding of Christ and his bride, where we are sealed and settled so that nothing can shake us out of our loyalty to God. What are Christ's intercessions within the sanctuary? His pleas to you and me to trust him and let him heal us. His actions to intervene and intercede with Satan, the lies, distortions, our guilt, shame, and anything that separates us from him to win us back to love and trust and purify us. What are the records in heaven and the judgment taking place at this time? The accurate transcript of every individuality, who we, who we actually are in heart, mind, character, and our judgments to trust Jesus and Jesus' therapeutic judgments to heal us. Why wait to 1844? Because God only wins with God's methods, truth, love, and freedom. And it wasn't until that time in history that the truth, the Bible, was available to cleanse the hearts and minds of the people. Let's close with prayer and then we'll, we'll break for potluck and we will come back at 1.30 to do all of the Q&A time and give you some time to maybe generate some questions. Gracious Father in heaven, we are so thankful for this beautiful message, this plan that you put into place, this plan that required you to sacrifice so much that Jesus came and accomplished in our behalf. And Jesus, we thank you so much as our heavenly high priest that you are working with all the agencies of heaven and you have sent your spirit to us, to plead with us, to trust you, to open our hearts to you. And we ask now, we, we, we extend, we say, yes, Lord, we trust you. We open our hearts. We ask that your spirit will be poured out to cleanse our hearts, minds from everything that separates from you, to unite us to you into eternal loyalty and make us true pillars in your sanctuary. Enable us to go out and win more people to friendship with you. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen.